Let's give people a chance. There we go. We'll give people a chance to um, just join in here. So we'll get going in a in a hot second or so. Uh, let's see if the chat's working. I'll do kind of my usual shout outs as people join in. So uh, give it a, give it a go to see if uh, if the chat works for you and and say hello. Um, and Trev, you can uh, you can help me say hello if you if you know folks as well from that. Uh, from that side of the world. Um, I know we've got people from um, some of our communities. So York, I believe is, uh, yeah, hi Alex. It seems to work for you. Good, 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 excellent. Um, and we can definitely say hello to you. I always love to love to see who's joining us and the beautiful places across this country that you're, you're coming from. So yeah, give that a go. It gives us a chance to, like I said, say hello to you and see who's in the room and for you guys to see who uh, who else is in the room too. Uh, Middleton Hope and downtown Lethbridge. Excellent. Hi, John. Um, actually, lovely. I love Lethbridge. I used to go there basically every week for a couple of years when you guys were doing some, some interesting uh, kind of uh, disruption work in, in terms of your approach to social challenges. So nice to see you. Nice to, nice to have you in the room. Um, anybody else want to say hello in the chat? Um, okay, Jameson on a Dime Transformations. Awesome. Really great organization if you're not familiar. Uh, Tina Young. Hi, Tina. Another Lethbridge um, person. Awesome. Excellent. Keep saying hello. And uh, part of our uh, process of learning more about the country is also to get you guys to drop in what uh, uh, First Nation or Indigenous territory treaty you're coming from as well if you know and it's if you don't know then it's a good opportunity to give that a google and then and then you uh you won't forget you can't unsee it as we say uh so northern sunrise county just uh east of peace river beautiful excellent hello amber marlene alta association of gerontology uh in airdrie excellent our neighbor um gerontology interesting uh, area of work uh, absolutely and uh no doubt uh, rising, uh, rising demand for your for your work as well, uh, for sure. Demographically speaking, Eric, hey, CMHC's in the house. Excellent. I was just chatting with uh, Debbie the other day, and I think I'm going to see some of your colleagues at the Canadian Alliance conference as well. So that's awesome. Are you coming, Eric? Maybe, maybe not. Okay. And okay. So I'll get us going, uh, just because I know folks have tons and tons of other uh, important things to do. So I really appreciate everybody's time um, with us as well. And like I said, please uh, please keep saying hello, because it's it's just as much about you guys as it is about uh, us getting to know you. It's also about you guys uh, learning about uh, colleagues across the country that are interested in, in similar things. So uh, topic of the day, AI supported social needs assessment, and it's a bit of a product launch for us. We've been working on this behind the scenes uh, pretty uh, intensively over the last quarter and are excited to share with you guys what, what's on tap for um, Help Seeker. Um, again, wouldn't be us without the land acknowledgement and again, encouraging you guys to uh, drop in where, where you're joining us from. I'm joining you from Okinsis Treaty 7. And the reason for uh, doing this, and it's been interesting because there's a lot of debate whether these land acknowledgements have become so uh, performative that they're no longer uh, important. And I'm, I'm of the mindset that they're, they're, more of, they're more of a prompt to us to continue to acknowledge that this work is, has huge implications when it comes to um, these systemic injustices and, and histories that are continuing to shape, shape social issues. So it's as much a, a reminder around our responsibilities to advance the TRC calls to action. For us as a tech company, we, we have to constantly uh, put that into our, our processes and, and policies as well. So everything from OCAP um, in terms of where it fits in our data policies to how we do analysis and ensuring that there's that, uh, that lens and showcasing um, the discrepancies when it comes to Indigenous experiences across social issues as well. So everybody's got their own relationship to this land acknowledgement. I'm um, making the commitment that we're going to continue to make it relevant and 
with, with the risk of being performative, I, the risk is not as, um, as risky as the reward of continuing to put this front and center in our work. So um, we'll move to uh, what's on tap for us. Um, the biggest thing in, in terms of the agenda today is to, to do a bit of a launch on um, a new AI um, supported uh, approach to doing social needs assessments in your communities and giving us some understanding of why this new technology is giving us a much, much more uh, sophisticated look and ability to move way quicker on social issues than we might have um, in the past. I'll give you some case studies. I'll give you some of the pros and cons to uh, bringing in new digital technologies when it comes to social needs assessment. Um, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about some case studies and just to give you an idea of how uh, we've been putting this in practice in, in the hands of uh, municipalities and uh, uh, charitable organizations, nonprofits, those being different and um, some of the funders that we've been working with that are taking a systems approach to their work. So we'll, we'll give you that. We'll tell you about pricing and timelines as well, what to expect from a, a product like this. And then we'll, uh, we'll do some Q&A as well. So that's what's on tap. Now, um, it wouldn't be a very good uh, presentation about social needs assessments and the future of these social needs assessments if you didn't understand what these things are and why they're so important. Most communities have some form of social needs assessment that they've they've done, sometimes haphazardly, sometimes systematically, but uh, the reasons for doing these, it's, and I think it's important to take a moment to understand that, why it's beneficial, uh, but not just beneficial, but essential. And that's primarily because they serve as this foundation uh, upon which effective inclusive policies are built, they ensure that uh, challenges don't go unnoticed and you're not missing an opportunity for improvement. So uh, the problem oftentimes is that we don't know what we don't know. So this value add of social needs assessments is to systematically unearth these hidden challenges in a community, social uh, challenges. We know communities are complex. They're complex uh, organisms. They're living things made up of living folks and the needs are not always visible on the surface. So the social needs assessment serves as this diagnostic tool, if you will, to help us uncover those hidden challenges that may be overlooked by conventional observation. So everybody has their own opinion, but what does the data say? And then how, how do we join the lived experience, our own observation, our own insights and expertise, but what does the data also say? And what's that fullest story now that we've got these, um, these different perspectives and the data together? So that obviously allows for very different targeted interventions that help address the root causes of social issues, not our um, opinion on what those social issues might be. Now, if you choose to go with the opinion, that's great, but you still know what those data informed um, challenges might be and root causes of what you might be seeing on the ground might be. Um, Data-driven insights from a policy funding perspective, they form assessments that are critical for informing those decisions and directing funding where it's needed most. They ensure resources are allocated more efficiently. They create that maximum impact for community members as well. Again, uh, sometimes listening to the loudest voice is in, might be a consideration in your decision making, but what if that's not actually the greatest need, right? And Balancing that is a, is a constant, uh, but I, not knowing is maybe the, you know, where we fall short when we don't do a good job of, of using data in, in social planning. Um, and then, of course, the ultimate piece is around enhancing community well-being. So the ultimate goal of a social needs assessment is that you're taking that insight and you're putting in actions to improve the overall well-being of community your understanding specific needs of a population, you can tailor programs and services to improve quality of life. And that obviously leads to more inclusive growth. I know every, every community wants to grow, every organization wants to grow. Well, I mean, that might be an assumption, but that's, that's at least who, who we tend to work with is folks that are looking to have that, that growth, that sustainable and inclusive growth. They want every member that they're supporting to, to be doing well. So if we don't understand the disparities, 
and on the other side, but if, if we do, then we can create those strategies that foster equity and inclusion, which ultimately leads to greater prosperity for everybody, greater economic uh, prosperity and social inclusion, they go hand in hand. Um, and then it allows you to, when you do these things on a systemic basis, it allows you to measure impact over time. So whether you're measuring social needs in a target population or a community um, at, uh, as a whole, that allows you to track progress as well to see is, is all the work we're doing making a difference or are we missing the root causes because again we, we might be we might not be unearthing those root causes and so our all our investments are going towards things that are actually not our problem or not our greatest problem so that's the the concept of why you know we're we focused on building a, a product that focuses on social needs assessment because it's so foundational. So every everybody needs um, one of these is is always what we what we think about. Um, so why does this matter when it uh, comes to traditional ways of doing social needs assessment? So what's new in terms of building some of this new technology into uh, traditional social needs assessment? And I would say we're kind of beyond um, improving, we've upended it. And that's primarily because of a, um, a bias towards technology and a bias towards bringing in um, artificial intelligence on in a pretty, um, I wouldn't say necessarily the most sophisticated way, but in a in a pretty uh, focused way on, on this specific problem. So we've got traditional methods of doing this that I, I wanna uh, take you through just so you know where what we're doing versus what the current approach is so having been a consultant in this space the way you normally do this is uh, grunt work right the the bedrock is primarily uh, built on on human effort and that's amazing and human effort is essential human insight is essential but there's a lot of um, there's a lot of downfalls to it as well. So traditional social needs assessment have been this bedrock upon uh, we've been building these understandings of communities. They've had a tremendous value. I'm not knocking it because I I'm one of these um, pre recovering consultants. I used to do uh, this work by hand, right? Um, and it, I think the the work I did and the work consultants do uh, in this space is, has continues to play an important role. However, as communities evolve and the digital revolution is taking hold of all of us, the tools we use to understand and um, deploy in the social space need to evolve as well. That would, it would do us a huge disservice if we didn't disrupt ourselves in, in this revolution uh, that technology and AI is, is pushing us towards whether we like it or not. So we're now looking, looking at these limitations of these methods in a very rapidly changing world. So it's it's not an option, right? We have to shift. That's that's the kind of impetus to my colleagues that are in the consulting world. And I know some of you, some of you guys are, are here too. And the, I'm guessing the reason for it is do you have an interest in artificial intelligence and how this can help your work as well? And you probably are getting the questions from uh, your clients, you know, why aren't we doing this faster? Why are we not using artificial intelligence to speed this up? And, and they're right, they're right to be asking these questions. The way we currently do social needs assessments are time intensive, they're manual, um, and they're, they're thorough, but they're inherently time intensive. They require an investment of time to collect, to analyze, to interpret the data, and just delays critical interventions and the implementation of social programs and policy because it's their clients are waiting on us to get them the report for them to review for them to put through their decision making processes as well that time is not just money but it's social need that might go unaddressed so we have an imperative to continue to refine how we do this work in better and better ways on the other side we've as we go through these lengthy processes, the information that we've been collecting is now outdated. So by the time traditional assessments are completed, data is no longer reflecting the current situation. And this lag not only leads to decisions that are based on outdated information, they actually sometimes risk our entire effort getting shelved because it's, it's too late now for it to be relevant. So it, there's a huge um, you know, loss of opportunity there for the community and for uh, our value proposition to, to clients as well. Um, the one-size-fits-all frameworks 
oftentimes, again, as, as consultants um, that do this work manually, traditional methods rely on standardized frameworks, essentially, you know, the, the cut, paste, modify methodology, methodology that is um, served as well in the past, but doesn't account for unique characteristics and the need for extreme personalization for the community. So this leads to a mismatch between recommendations and how many of us have done the, the recommendations that, uh, and sometimes the client will come back and say, oh, you, you forgot to uh, remove that, that name of the other community and you handed me a report that says, um, that says this other community's name or this other organization's name. So, you know, we're, we're constantly uh, needing to to personalize so that we and it's correct because every community every organization uh, has very unique context and so the old way of using these frameworks and recycling them it's it's a it never met the the needs in the first place but we have tools now to do that way better at scale personalization at scale is absolutely possible now with these new digital tools uh, resource heaviness, the extensive use of resources in terms of human labor, financial expenditure, makes traditional um, assessments a significant investment. And what I'm talking about is 50, 60, 70, hundred thousand dollars, two hundred fifty thousand dollars for uh, these uh, needs assessments that are, you know, intensive in human labor, and of course they have to go through some massive budgeting processes and approvals. That actually has a cost to cities, to municipalities. They have to put things out through procurement. They have to put things out through, um, through various decision makers within uh, the city that takes time away from other, other work as well. So there's, you know, obviously there's gotta be a, a better way. And then ultimately the static insights. So you do a report and then it's, that's about it. It's a report. How do we build in some of these insights on a more dynamic basis so that um, our, our municipalities, our organizations are getting insights on a go forward basis from this investment rather than a one time thing. So at a pace which traditional assessments can adapt to this new information uh, that's often limited, this hinders the community's ability to respond quickly to so changing social needs and impacts ultimately the well being of, um, of their community members as well. So um, advancing beyond tradition with AI, and you guys have heard Help Seeker talk about AI. We're an AI-led company. We do data, we, we do AI, and we focus on the social, uh, social issues in particular. So I don't think it's going to, I don't think I need to defend or explain why um, AI has been such a, such a critical set of tools for us. So a little bit about AI's impact, and we know um, we know we've done our um, our work um, in terms of educating you guys and for why uh, these tech revolutions are critical to, for us to understand. But um, the reason for AI's impact is is it's pervasive across industry, and it's definitely transformative when it comes to social challenges as well. So they're not just a they're not just a um, a little tweak, they're a transformative and absolutely a paradigmal shift for how we do this work. I can't stress this enough. enough. Um, their ability to do rapid data analysis of so speed uh, being an essence of social planning, um, the ability to stay current and relevant by plugging into real-time information, the ability to um, bring very, very tailored insights to communities and personalize everything so uh, and i'm talking about i'm a mayor versus i'm a ceo a ceo versus i'm a policy analyst my interest today is on homelessness this afternoon it's on food security and tomorrow morning it's on economic diversification the ability to to get that insight on demand from the data is what ai can do through these social needs assessments that are powered by, by artificial intelligence. So you're not longer needing to commission a new study. You can actually get this, get these insights on demand, personalized to your role, personalized to your objectives in real time. That's amazing. That's new and that's a complete shift from, from the old way of doing, um, doing business for sure. The tailoring to communities is, is critical too. Every community's um, dynamics are very unique as well. Their network, of stakeholders is unique. There's so many relationships for us as humans to keep them all in our heads is impossible. 
but with artificial intelligence, bringing in some of these data science techniques, absolutely, absolutely manageable. So that's a huge, huge add. Um, efficiency and resource optimization is uh, not just about speed, it's about also using resources wisely. So ability to optimize human and financial resources, ensuring that investments are actually going to the right uh, priorities. And I'll give you an example from a community recently of, of their critical questions. Is, our, is the money we're putting into the community actually meeting the needs of that community? We can do those calculations now. It's not, it's not as accounting for um, you know, the perspectives of community members. Um, we can bring that in as well, but from a data perspective, pretty much on demand. And so that agile responsiveness becomes a huge um, value add for, for decision makers. They can move faster to, uh, to market with some, some new solutions. I do wanna say, um, and I've uh, been, I don't know, maybe overly optimistic about AI, but you know, you, with the right guardrails and the right human AI collaborations, I think those um, some of those challenges can can really be mitigated. And there's there's amazing work done in in ethics of artificial intelligence, and um, especially for for us having had that focus on AI being a B Corp, you know, these guardrails are pretty well developed and have been developed from the from the get-go and there's tons of tons of research and and work being uh, done on on creating more and more of these um, these ethics around artificial intelligence deployment at large now having said that nothing's going to replace the human touch right so human directed analysis um, is absolutely a critical part of deploying the AI well. So for us at Help Seeker, at least, when you work with um, us and our AI tools, you still get that, that social expertise, right? The systems planning expertise from the, our customer success team, folks that have been the, in the system and working in, in social issues for their entire careers. So it's the human, um, human as in social expertise uh, folks, you guys as the customer, and then of course the, the AI as a third um, player in the conversation. So it's it's never just a, you know, here's the AI and figure it out yourself. You're, you're getting that, again, personalization of experience. Um, but think of AI as that catalyst. It's high powered engine in a vehicle for uh, getting that social needs assessment done quicker with more precision and with more personalization. And it's finally that strategic application because you can get this beautiful report that's personalized and you still can't get over the, you know, the emerging um, barriers, the change management stuff, the mentoring, the coaching, the all that human stuff that a, a chatbot or a report or any of these kind of data um, products are, are never going to do for you. So we always look at it as a, as a package deal between the human and the AI tools um, when it comes to our work. So um, AI supported needs assessment. I wanted to give you a, a bit of a, uh, an overview of what that's offering. So you'll see here uh, data-driven customization, AI tool set, the variety, dynamic AI analytics, and beyond data analysis. I want to give you a sense of our approach to these because it, you might be considering other um, AI driven products in the marketplace. So our value prop is around this customization that um, it's not just a, it's not just a, a route spit out component. If you want that, we have that too, um, but we have the ability to personalize um, basically top to bottom for um, your use cases. So we can reflect the micro and the macro aspects of the community, um, goes beyond numbers, uh, really gets into the community's own story, its challenges and potential as well. So that data-driven customization is there. Uh, you won't see, um, unless people want that, right? Some people do, they just want the, they press the easy button. And uh, again, I'll, I'll give you an example of a, of a community who is like I just need I just need to literally tick a box <laughs> and uh, submit this, and I need it yesterday, and that's fine. And we'll worry about customization, you know, next week. But that's absolutely that's absolutely your prerogative if if that's that's your jam. But that option is there to customize the full um, the full output. 
uh, the AI tool set variety. So, you know, people will say, what, what model do you use? Do you use uh, Llama or do you use uh, GPT-4? Do you use, um, you know, a whole number of, of um, aspects? And we actually use a multi-agent approach. It depends on the use case is what we say. We use everything and that's on the market that is going to meet the needs of, of that customization. And we have a, a pipeline to ensure that that's done in the most efficient way for, for you guys as well. So that's um, another value prop is we don't rely on any one um, aspect out there. Uh, dynamic AI analytics, I'll tell you a little bit about this that when you work with us, you're not just getting this stagnant report, you're also getting access to a dynamic um, AI analytics that are updated on every two weeks. There's new, something new coming out because we recognize that, um, you know, census is as stale as the year it got <laughs> reported. How do we take some of those insights and actually create, um, create a data set that grows with you and with your needs, how do we bring in other data sets, uh, your own data sets as well, to actually give you a closer read on what's happening in the community and close to real time as possible. And beyond data analysis, so like I said, it's, it's not just about data, but bringing in our team's expertise in social systems planning and social policy, social um, problems that range, like I said, from working with folks in the safety realm, police and correctional services to uh, nonprofits that might be looking at uh, fundraising to um, folks that are mapping the food system to folks that are looking at mental health and, and young people to homelessness and encampment. So our team works across these issue areas and we specialize in this work. So when we, when we work with you, you're getting that expertise as well. Um, because we don't we don't just let you have the tool without it without support. So a couple of uh, examples here, and I, I picked on Chestermere because it I was literally in front of City Council with them um, this week, so it, it was fresh in my mind. But um, I'll give you an example um, here. So it's not just any community. It's a uh, Chestermere is actually in, in Alberta, so neighbor neighbor to to us but um, has its own pulse and it's very, diff very different needs than it, than it did five years ago before the pandemic. One of them has been that um, it's continued to grow for sure, the, the uh, inflow of migration and people needing more affordable housing opportunities out of Calgary has been a huge, um, huge driver of that. It's also a city that's, that's densifying relatively quickly at very different rates than other communities in, um, in Canada, actually. It's also interestingly got a very, very interesting mix of uh, newcomers that are changing the demographics almost overnight. And it's, um, it's specifically um, obviously to do with, with its proximity to Calgary and, and the proximity to northeastern parts of Calgary where, where we have very distinct um, ethnocultural groups that are, that are moving in and, and similarly moving into kind of the eastern part of the region as well. So it's a community that's getting into increasingly uh, dense and increasingly diverse. So whereas the community needs uh, five years ago were around how are we going to support an aging community, now it's about, wow, we've got a, a younger community, they want a more urban experience, they, um, they are not necessarily primed for supporting newcomers either, and uh, we want to grow, we want that economic vibrancy, yet you know, we're, we're managing this massive shift that's happening relatively quickly. So interesting challenges. Municipality is the customer here. Um, their challenge was to, um, you know, bring some of this data into the discussion and understand where the city might go in terms of its strategic approach, approach to social policy. In the past, social policy wasn't uh, necessarily the kind of a top line priority for um, the municipal government and not in, not in the negative way, it was uh, part of a departmental role in uh, FCSS in particular, but with these challenges and with kind of growing relatively quickly and seeing social issues emerge relatively quickly, it's now a high, 
high level priority for council and, and council obviously needing that information to, to move forward. At the departmental level, however, we've got a, a department that is emergent, that it's a relatively new um, business area at that kind of high visibility and, and very politicized uh, social challenges in, in the community. So we're seeing a housing stress, we're seeing um, some of the, the tensions around growth as well. So that, that is the, the context, right? So starting with something that's, that's data-driven puts them in a very different conversation with, uh, with community and with considering their own investment. So one of the immediate things that they wanted to understand is, you know, given these social needs that are here, is our investment, so is the money we're, we're putting into social programming aligned? with this, right? And, and if it's not, right? And of course, there's always room for better alignment. That's That was the, the immediate finding. Are we better off moving some of the investments? Are we, are, do we even have enough investment for the level of social needs we have? And if we don't, you know, is what is the role and the strategy of the municipality? What is the role of council? What is the role of community partners? What is the role of provincial partners? in moving our community forward in a positive way. So that was the use case for them. And obviously the, the report had to answer these questions and uh, AI enabled us to do it very quickly. And it, uh, AI was able to unearth some of these hidden challenges that I explained to you that um, again, we not that we had a feeling, of course the, the city had you know, have their own observations and, and their own insights from a professional perspective and, and lived experience perspective, but having the data to actually talk about this in a in an evidence-led way, you know, brings a different, depoliticizes some of the conversation and allows them to make this, you know, strategic decisions. They might still be, and they will continue to be political decisions, but they've got the data now to, to understand uh, the risks, the opportunities, and of course, the the needs and where and where the strategy might go on a uh, moving forward basis. So their decision is to um, to look at this concept of a social master plan and to look at the opportunity to build a different type of approach to social planning that um, elevates the issue. Obviously, this is council's decision. It's not you know it's not our decision. We're we're just uh, um, enabling tools to have the conversations, but. Um, moving towards community specific insights that are not just data points, they're actionable, they are um, guiding the actual use case and the problem that that's being faced by the community, and this being a collaborative approach so not just feeding folks reports actually working with them to ensure that they're getting answers to what their their kind of burning uh, questions are and acknowledging that. Council's questions are very different than administration's questions, and even within council, there's very different questions within um, each each councillors as well. So, getting those neighborhood specific insights is um, really really important for for folks that are wanting to understand their neighborhood and their ward, and how that fits in in the greater whole of of the community as well. As a really good example, and in terms of Chestermere administration. The land use bylaws questions are going to be very different than FCSS, which is the, the social planning uh, area, very different again than um, engineering and recreation. So how do we deliver custom insights for each of those departments based on this analysis? So that's case study one. Um, the next one I wanted to highlight, and, and it's basically because while we talk about social needs assessment at large, um, so what are what are the highlight challenges at, at a community level? There has also been applications of this where customers have said, that's awesome, social needs assessments are amazing. I wanna know specifically about one domain, one focus area, which is, and I'm highlighting here housing um, in particular. So that is another way of uh, slicing this work. So ability to customize by area of concern or domain. And again, if you put a lens of Chester Mirror and dig into housing, um, a very, very different um, angle to the, to the insights you're, you're able to achieve as well. So as we prepare to uh, embark on, a, on this new use case, and um, I'm not sure, 
Travis, if we're allowed to talk about it, I'm not sure if we signed the, did we sign the contract? Are we allowed to, to say who it is in this case? Um, anyways, it's a community out, outside of Calgary. I'm sticking to my, to my Alberta examples today, but again, for them, it's having the, the, the ability to customize the needs assessment to a domain area and housing being one. And for us, the ability to come to the meeting and say, here's your, here's your base analysis and using our, our AI tool to get the, a really robust baseline off the top. Here's your 100 page report. Let's go through it. Now, let's set the stage for that in-depth analysis. And um, they have additional data that they wanted to bring in. They have some weightless data. They have some homelessness data. They've got some um, kind of programmatic level data sets. They've got some land use bylaw. Um, components that they want to throw in the pile. Okay. And that's great as well. It, it adds more insight on top of um, what we're able to prepare, like off the top. So getting that AI enhanced data integration between their data sets into our um, data sets gives us that in-depth analysis for future planning as well. And of course, this whole thing doesn't work without the human aspect, right? Because our, our um, experts in affordable housing and homelessness can guide and, and suggest and give examples of how other communities have brought these together to answer their, their questions. So they're, they're going to have very different um, use case in this community than Chester Mir did um, in my earlier example. But it's to give you a sense of the ability to customize the stuff at scale. All right. So um, because this is a, a product launch, it wouldn't do a good job if I didn't talk about pricing as well. So a little bit about that. Um, our whole proposition is that we want to make this affordable. We want to make sure that, that we're continuing to develop and stay as a sustainable um, social enterprise as well. But the end game here is to make sure everybody has what they need to make these decisions as well. And that cost is no longer a barrier to data informed decision making. So um, you will see that our prices are quite low for the quality and speed um, of work as well as the, the custom experience and, and getting the access to our expert team. So uh, foundational assessments start at that 4999 and delivery timeline, I mean, just between negotiating, getting inside your guys' heads and delivery of an initial product in about a week, right? So running the, the analysis is is uh, great, but we need to to kind of get your get your brains inside our brains so that we can um, make sure that that we deliver the best product to you. So, it, but in as little as a week. Now, if there's folks that and we've had this these questions say, what if we have additional data sets? And actually, it's a I'll use this example because York I think is in the house. Uh, if I saw from the the webinar list. So we're working with York Region. It's got nine communities, nine uh, municipalities within York Region, huge, huge area and huge growth in, in that community and, and change um, over time. And each one of those nine is very different. Like Aurora is very different than Markham, very different than Newmarket. Uh, so uh, it's a, actually a really good example where they had, I believe 18 different data sets that they wanted to throw in. And their uh, focus area was around homelessness. So again, a, a not housing, not a general social needs assessment. They wanted to kind of hone in on homelessness. Um, so enhanced data options are always on the table. I love seeing the, the kinds of data that every community has. These guys had probably like, I mean, it was a joy, honestly. I'm, I'm gonna give them York region some mass props on their data quality. But interestingly, they had never put it together like this before. And it's just time, right? Uh, too many data sets. Like some came from um, this department over here that was managing income assistance. This data came from the bylaw team that was responding to encampments. This data came from their um, CRM um, or homeless management information system, HIFIS. That's, and that actually came in a bunch of piles. So anyways, there was a lot of complexity in those 18 data sets. So using artificial intelligence to join those data sets, process the data sets, clean them, actually connect the dots, and then putting them with our AI tools and then giving them those insights, their interests were really around predictions 
around homelessness and forecasting resource allocation. So very interesting project, but you know, same logic applies, right? So if you guys do have uh, data that you want to throw in the mix because you think there's some interesting insights, by all means. And of course, the there's those timelines. And for again, for York Region, I'll use them as an example. They uh, they said, well, we we've got we've got a city meeting, we've got 18 data sets, and we've got a month to get this done because we need to go to council. So we're absolutely aware that some of these things are are really time sensitive, and we'll we'll work with you guys to to scope that out. Um, but ultimately, our goal is around transparent cost structures. So you're not going to have any surprises. We we have pretty um, solid assessment approaches so that you know what you're getting and there's no surprises. Like, ah, uh, it's more complex than I thought. So now it's you know, another $30,000. Oops, I, I tricked you. We don't do that. So uh, when we negotiate, it's it's all in. We, we get it done. So that's, um, that's the, the gist there. Um, just in terms of packaging as well, for those of you that are looking at, um, at these options, um, if we do have packages as well that bring some of that um, systems expertise or uh, social expertise in these diverse areas. So we have these standard social needs assessments or housing needs assessment or you know, um, those areas of, of interest you might have that are AI driven and human, human quality assured. Like I said, um, they also come with a um, Cardo 365 membership, and I'll tell you what that means. So while we have these deliverables, like I mentioned around York or Chestermere, which are these uh, nice technical assessments, we uh, do see this value add of not, not just doing this as a one-off and bringing in some of that dynamic real-time data to you guys. So in working with your teams, with folks that are evaluators, the folks that are analysts, et cetera, we actually see that there's huge appetite for them to scale up their capacity and use of data at that, not personal, but professional level. So uh, folks that are looking to uh, scale up their staff or you know, don't quite need a data scientist on staff or can't really justify the cost, uh, this is another really great option because you get um, essentially a fractional um, data science social expert. Uh, so you get uh, those 20 hour, I think it's 20 hours. I'll, actually, I have a, another slide on that. I'll talk to you more, more about that. And you get that one-on-one -on -one coaching for, some, for uh, your staff members as well on it. So how to use the data in writing briefing notes and uh, developing packages for council, et cetera. Uh, or option two, there's a billion ways to cut and slice. And uh, all we can say is um, we can customize anything, but the, the game is always to bring the prices down, quality and efficiency up. And that's call us, call us for that custom quote. Uh, the Carter 365 license, just to give you guys a sense, if you do have folks on your team that are interested in this, make sure uh, you consider it as well. So what's included is platform access to um, our Cardo platform. So those focus analytics specific to your community, there's always new stuff happening in there. So you're always getting fed novel uh, data. Um, they're focused, so the insights are generated for you. So you don't, again, you don't have to analyze yourself. You can cut and paste and put it in a deck and off you go. So it really helps with uh, bringing data into your processes without having to bring consulting in every turn. Um, Cardo on demand, so custom research briefings, you get two of these per um, for your membership as well. So if you have a 15, 20 page paper you need on X uh, that needs, needs to have that, that data, we can kind of deploy our AI to that and our experts to that end. Strategic sessions, you get two annual sessions with our expert team as well. If, again, look at these as a pocket consulting with pocket data analytics without needing to, um, to staff up or, or go through an uh, intensive procurement process. Um, Cardo Signals, for those that haven't been around, Cardo Signals is where we take emergent issues. So we did a bunch of, uh, of these recently. One was on um, mental health and youth post-COVID. So things around vaping was one. Another one was around xylazine and emergent psycho um, substances, these novel substances impacting us. 
Um, so those are done and really comprehensive, really thought out papers on strategic insights that things you need to know about, things that are going to make sure you're on top of social issues that are happening across the country. Just again, we're in all these communities. We know what's happening on the ground. We're feeding you that that insight um, ahead of ahead of trend, uh, if you will. And then we also offer these monthly discussion groups. So again, if you've got team members that are wanting to connect with folks across the countries that are thinking um, systemically, thinking around social issues and wanting to get ahead of these, of these issues as well, there's some really great collaborations happening there. So we, we bring folks together in these Cardo uh, discussions, uh, Cardo signal discussions. And then of course you get that dedicated strategic lead. So the human, not just the, not just the, the artificial intelligence uh, and data analytics access. And uh, you get the, that email support too. So uh, you get those, those um, kind of customer experience with the product and platform access as well. So hopefully that gives you some sense there. Um, I'll give you guys a sense of, uh, of more if you're interested and we'll, we'll hook you up with uh, partnerships if you're interested in, in purchasing this. But let's see what Q&A we've got and we'll, we'll go from there. So um, data sources that you've used in the Chestermere work, how did uh, the AI help you analyze and interpret data better than the manual process? So I'll, I'll answer this one. Um, so the data sources in uh, the Chestermere work I mean, you've, you've got your, uh, in a housing needs assessment, it's gonna be very different than in a social needs assessment, but um, essentially the, there's always a baseline. You always have to use your, um, kind of your population demographic data sets uh, first as that setting the groundwork because everything kind of flows from the population. So you need to have a really in-depth um, neighborhood level analysis of population demographics. How do we do that? Custom, um, custom uh, API from Statistics Canada is how we do that. Um, sometimes the focus might be on crime. So um, there, there would be those data sources uh, where, where the community is really interested in, in, um, in crime that are brought in. Um, the other one around um, safety and mental health and addiction. So things like um, overdose rates, things like public health, um, uh, surveys that get uh, get released by the health region in that community as well. Um, there's everything from employment and unemployment that are that are rates that are happening on a monthly basis. So things like inflation that we get from um, from market data and um, merging that with the population data, merging that with some of this health data as well. Uh, another great source of data is on supply is our own data set that we uh, develop using, again, an artificial um, intelligence um, process that actually brings in unstructured data. So scraping the internet for information and then bringing some of that insight about what's happening in the community to you guys as well. So you have a sense of what the chatter is in the community and also what the supply of supports is in the community as well. So um, yeah, all of, all of those, depending on the use case, of course. So in the social needs assessment work in, in Chestermere would be um, definitely the Statistics Canada data sets, Canada revenue data sets, um, the, um, again, the mental health and addictions and the safety components are critical to social needs assessments to understand those. Um, yeah. All right, let's see what else we got in the chat. Okay. Uh, contact info for PowerPoint along with contact at Chestermere. This may have application. Mayor's task force on lawlessness. Ooh, that sounds very interesting. Um, yeah, sure, John. Um, we'll, we got your email. We'll, we'll send you, we'll intro you, you to, um, to um, the Chestermere council folks for sure. You guys definitely have, I'm sure, lots to talk about uh, otherwise too. Um, yeah, you betcha. Susan, is there a level of buy-in into this methodology at the provincial level? I think that probably depends on, on the province and probably on the department. So um, we did actually just get an invite to, to make an application on, a, on a, using the, this methodology around gender-based violence 
uh, and that was at a provincial level. Obviously, we, let, let's see how let's see how it pans out. Um, and in that case, it's it's actually part for us. It's we're using these tools to partner with academic experts in the area, so kind of powering them up. Right, so that they can do their best work doing that community engagement, the qualitative, deep, deep uh, level of analysis and engagement, um, but then letting us do the, the kind of the stuff that we're good at, the data work we're good at, and speeding that up. So in, in this case, imagine in, in Alberta, we've got you know, hundreds and hundreds of municipalities. How do we ensure that we have a gender-based analysis needs analysis for every one of them that's custom well and in a couple months you have to use this methodology if you want that level of analysis and if you, if you don't you're probably going to miss you're not going to be able to customize very well right because you're you're glossing over or you're doing you're doing one big report for from a provincial perspective and you you might do some regional analysis but you're not going to go in depth on each community and each community merits that level of analysis if you're truly building a, a provincial strategy that that is meant to meet those localized needs so i you know it depends on the on the province i would say and their prioritization of um of localized needs as well now if, if they just want a alberta wide thing then you know, you only have 10, you only have 10 jurisdictions that would need that. It probably, you know, doesn't, doesn't make much sense to look at scale, but it would still, you know, the same pitch would apply. It's more efficient and more cost efficient to do it this way for sure. Save your, save the taxpayer dollars for something, something else. Um, yes, we will be sending things to, um, to the, to all of you guys for sure. Um, Dan from City of Yellowknife, traditional lands of, okay, uh, actually, Dan, uh, City of Yellowknife, I think we're, we're doing something with you guys. I think it's a jurisdictional policy scan, but I might be, I might be getting that wrong. Any other questions? And I, I'm not seeing any, but I'm, I'll keep a, keep an eye out on it. Um, and if you guys do drop them in, uh, that's cool. Uh, Travis put in the partnerships at helpseeker.org for any contact info if you're interested in this or if you've got some ideas and you're not 100% sure if this fits or not or if you're interested in further convos. But I'll go to um, my last slide, which is the one I do want to give you a nice, a nice juicy pitch on uh, because it's our next webinar. This is this is my alma mater. This is my area of expertise, homelessness in Canada. And um, the reason the reason I'm, I'm ready to, to have this conversation is because I've been I've been deep in the data on a number of uh, these uh, these communities that we've been supporting over the last um, year that has really um, I'm not sure how to say it, but has really kind of shook my assumptions about what's going on. Um, and I, I feel like I feel like you guys need to know about it as well. So this is a critical one for us um, to do to do a really, really um, excellent job on for you guys and, and really share with you what we're seeing in terms of uh, homelessness trends. We've got a unique um, viewpoint We're we're all over. Right. We're in northern BC. We're in Northwest Territories. We're in the smallest you know, community of. 30 people and we're in, like I said, York region, biggest region in, in the country. So, and we're, we're seeing all of it. And I, I really wanna do that in-depth um, viewpoint. We're in all of your guys' data as well, <laughs> all the time. Um, and we're we're starting to see some, some important things that I, I think you guys need to know about. So we'll go through some of those, the trends that we're seeing that you might not be aware just because you're you're in your own um, space, you're worrying about, about your own community, rightfully. Um, we're going to go into the data analytics for strategy and policy. Um, so I'm, I'm really excited about this stuff because I want to give you a sense of how data is being used, or at least how we're looking at using data in new ways to advance this field and advance new solutions to this age old problem. Um, we're going to be covering a range of critical topics. So we'll go through these um, to these homelessness trends that we're seeing. I want to give a specific um, focus to encampments as well as a as a novel 
not novel in terms of we've had encampments historically, you know, even in the 1930s Dust Bowl. So it's not that it's new, but the way it's manifesting today is distinct. I want to go through that in specific detail as well. But I also want to talk to you guys about predictive modeling and give you some of those use cases on how communities are, are preparing very differently for, for these than, than we might have in the past. So um, if that sparks your, in, your interest, please do put this on your, on your um, to-do list and share it with other folks that might have an interest in, in dealing with homelessness challenges in their communities. Like I said, we're, we're seeing this stuff in, in communities of as little as 40 people, right? So it's, it's something, um, I don't think we've seen this, this level of, um, of challenge in at least since I've been around for the last 20 years. So something has to change in our strategy. Um, and the, the data is giving us some novel considerations um, that we'll, we'll share with you guys. So that's the, um, the game there. I might, I'm chatting with two um, potential speakers to join me just to bring that community perspective as well and showcasing what they're doing. Um, I'll keep you posted on that, um, but definitely um, really want you to encourage attendance to this one because I think this is a critical one. And um, there's also the National Alliance um, to End Homelessness Conference happening next week. So I'm definitely gonna be seeing some of you folks there. If you're there, we're, hit us up, we're, we're gonna have a booth. And uh, I really look forward to getting those specific insights from those folks that are working on the ground and bringing those back to our webinar. That's going to be November 30th, 10 a.m. and Mountain Standard Time. I should probably put that in the EST, but, you know, acknowledging my Calgaryness here. So that's, uh, that's it for today, you guys. I really, really thank you for participating and hopefully this, this picked your interest. Hopefully you're, you're seeing the, the opportunity and uh, hopefully we also see you next time at the Homelessness in Canada Data Form Informed Response webinar. Thanks and see you, uh, see you then. Bye everyone. Thanks.